back, uh, tough after lunch. So here's the plan. I want to continue, so today we'll still talk about spatial coupling and I want to give you some idea about, uh, you know, other than the nice pictures and the moving things, how this actually works and what's behind it. So we'll, we'll spend probably at least an hour still on the board um, trying to go through the main ideas in, in the proof and probably takes a little bit more than an hour and then after that I'll still show you some uh, pictures again about some more applied ideas or some more, um, you know, ideas that you need when you actually want to implement it has to do with the speed and, you know, rate loss, etc. So some ideas that if you actually wanted to use this um, that you would have to think about. And perhaps at the end, if we still have time, um, someone asked me, you know, so far I haven't given any references, I haven't told you anything about where these things come from. So maybe I tell you just a little bit the story um, because the story was not that someone looked for that. The story was completely random and so maybe since I haven't given any references and perhaps it's interesting to see how sometimes you look for something completely different and then you find, you know, something that you didn't expect. Okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll see a little bit. So let me just recall from what we did yesterday. Um, so yesterday we talked about a standard low density paracheck code. And, you know, we had this code here. And I'm always going to use this as an example. And so what we said is if we think of transmission of an erasure channel with erasure probability epsilon, then we have this message passing algorithm or belief propagation was the algorithm. And we said that in the, in the initial phase, I'm going to, um, and I want to know after L iterations, what is the probability of erasure that I have. And so remember, the initially the message, the probability that I, or the message that I send is the received one. And so what's the chance that that's erased? Well, let me call this quantity x, let's say, zero. So the prob probability that the initial message is erased was epsilon. And so then after one, after, uh, you know, the, let's say, alpha iteration, this was some function of the epsilon and whatever the erasure probability was in the previous iteration. And where the f of the epsilon and x was equal to epsilon 1 minus 1 minus uh, x to the r minus 1 to the L minus 1, right? And recall how this came about. It just came about by looking at the at a, a node here, looking what the message is after a certain iteration. So I have an incoming, so I have one node here I pick. I pick one message or one edge. Maybe I pick this node, and I'm looking what will be in the alpha iteration, the message that I send in. This depends on the other incoming nodes. So these are the other incoming nodes. And then this is attached to check nodes, and this is again attached to variable nodes. And so um, remember that we thought about this in the limit where I have a fixed number of iteration and the tree goes to infinity. So all these messages are independent. And so if I have here the probability x of being erased, then here are r minus 1 uh, incoming messages. So what's the chance at a, at a check node that this is erased? Well, this will be erased as long as a single one of them is erased, right? So the erasure probability uh, will be 1 minus 1 minus x to the r minus 1. That's the probability that message is erased. And then here I have l minus 1 messages here. And so this will be erased as long as, so I have also the observed one here. So this will be erased if this one is erased and all of them are erased, right? And so that's where the epsilon this is the quantity that we have already seen here, times this to the power L minus one comes in, right? So this is the number if, if now after L iteration, I want to know what happens, I just plug this in. And it's not very hard to see that this function is monotone in both of its components. And so if I do more and more iterations, these XLs will be decreasing, okay? So this XL, that's easy to see, that they're actually decreasing as a function of L, and they start with epsilon, and of course they're never non, they're never negative. So this means that this XL actually will converge to something, right? Okay, so we'll get back to this in a second. And so in particular, in the first iteration, we have seen that if I want to do an estimate at any point in time, 
So this, one, this is what the messages look like, the message uh, erasure probabilities. But if I want to do an estimate, it's slightly different. The, for the estimate, I'm using all the edges that come in, right? And so for the estimate after the first round, for example, we have seen if this was epsilon originally, then we have seen that the extrinsic estimate, so this was the estimate without taking into account the observation itself, right? Just from what I get from the code constraints, we have seen that this has the form one minus uh, epsilon to the r minus one and to the l. So the only difference is here that here I take all the things into account, right? And I don't have the epsilon here because I don't take the observation itself into account. And so what we said is from, uh, from this one, we get an, a bound. And this will become important in a second. So this function looks whatever, something like this. And we said that this is some suboptimum. This corresponds to the performance of some suboptimum decoder. Right? So the actual erasure probability, because it's only one iteration and it's only some iterative algorithm, it's not the optimum. So if I used an optimum algorithm, then this probability of erasure would have to be somewhere below. Right? We don't know exactly where it is. would have to be somewhere below. Um, and so we don't know what that curve looks like. Maybe it looks like something like this or whatever. Right? But we said the following, that because there was this code invariant, right? Because if I'm plotting this curve and I'm looking at the actual one, so this is for the map performance. And so this area is equal to code rate. And the code rate for, it, for this case is one minus L over R, if you figure this out, okay? Then we get a bound by simply not integrating this curve, which we don't know, but integrating the curve that's slightly above, or is above. And so what we will get is an estimate for what the, where this threshold is, right? This upper bound on the map threshold. And so for this one particular example that I gave you, just even this one iteration, if you compute where this bound is, you will get something like 0 0.49, I think it was 1.5 or something. And so uh, this is strictly less than a half. So this shows, for example, that the code is not capacity achieving, right? Um, um, but, you know, has some, but this is just some arbitrary bound. So now, since this is after one iteration, right? Clearly, we should do the same thing to get better bounds since these things are monotonic. So this means if I do this after two iterations, I'll get another curve here, whatever. And so since I know that these things are monotone, you know, why not try to come up with the best bound that we can have, right? And so, so now uh, it might seem a little bit cumbersome to you know, do this after two because these things will become complicated. But it's actually not so bad. Why? Because this is monotone and this function is continuous. And so this means um, we're starting somewhere positively, we, st we, we stay somewhere positively, it's continuous. So this means that the limit, if I now let L go to infinity, must be actually a fixed point of this equation. Okay, so this means if I'm looking for the best bound that I can get by this, then I should think of L becoming large, right? And if L becomes large, then this, this curve is actually, again, easy to determine. So let's try to do this, right? So this means um, it must be true that X, so I'm looking for a fixed point now. Right, so it must mean that this limiting curve that I'm looking for must be a solution to this fixed point equation. Is it, is it clear what I'm doing, right? So I have a recursion. I know the recursion is monotonically decreasing. Okay, so there must be, it must go to a limit. And the function itself is continuous. So, so this limit must be a solution to this fixed point equation. Okay, so we'll just, we just must be a solution to this. Now, 
in general, even for these very simple regular codes, uh, you know, it doesn't look like it's easy to solve for, for x here, right? Because in general, this will be polynomials. But it's trivial to solve for epsilon, right? So instead of looking for an x for an epsilon, let's look for an epsilon for an x. And that's, of course, trivial. So, right, so we just have Right, and so now in parametric form, um, what we have is that this curve is simply this. Right, so you see that for every x, then x can go from 0 to 1, there's one particular epsilon that's associated to it. Make sense? OK, so let's look now what this looks like, this curve. So let's draw this. And again, we draw always in our box 0 to 1, 0 to 1. So we have 0 to 1. and. Uh, uh, yeah, so just, just a second, I was a little bit too fast. So this is indeed for a particular x, the epsilon here. But I don't want to draw the x here. What I want is the exit value. Okay, so, so what I really want to draw here is the following. Okay, so that's the curve that I want to draw, right? Remember, this is the final decision given that the message is x. What is my best estimate for a particular node? OK, so this is what I want to draw. So this is from all the other code constraints, not looking at the bit itself. What's my chance that I can decode this bit? And that's the probability that I can't, maybe that it will be erased. OK, so if I plot this, then um, OK, so we know, you know this will somehow look like something like this, right? Now, it turns out that, in general, this curve will actually look like something like this. OK, so if I'm drawing this curve here, then this curve will have a shape like this. And so now let's try to think a little bit what is the interpretation for this, right? Uh, so this was the eps, and this was the, sorry? Did I, ch oh, the r, sorry, okay, I'm chasing the r, thank you very much. Okay, this is an r, and this is the l, and that's correct. Okay, thanks. So what is the interpretation of this? The interpretation is fairly simple. When I'm, when I'm transmitting at a particular value epsilon, right, then initially from the other code constraint, in the, in the, since I'm not, gonna, I'm not being allowed to look at the bit itself, initially if I have done zero iterations, I have no information coming from the rest. And so initially I'm starting with my estimate, my extrinsic estimate somewhere here, OK? It's, it's erased. I have no information that comes. Now, after one iteration, I'll get some estimate, and I will have a slightly smaller erasure probability, OK? Maybe something like this. OK, and then I do another one. This is monotone. I go down. And so what happens is that I'll go down until I hit this fixed point. So this fixed point is the stable fixed point. It's the fixed point that I'm actually reaching. Is that clear? So if I'm looking at the, the whole upper part of this curve, this curve here, then this whole part has the operational meaning that these are the fixed points that are stable and the fixed point that I'll actually reach when I do this, when I do this decoding operation. But curiously enough, there are some other fixed points here that are not reachable, right? Because they're shadowed by these stable ones here, uh, but that are still there. And it turns out that, at least for the analysis, these are as important as the other ones. Okay? And now we'll, we'll try to see 
why that is why this is true. Okay, so the actual iterative decoder would have a curve like this, and at some point you can see here it would jump down to zero, and that's the curve that you would see on the iterative, right? But um, what we are interested in is right now not the iterative one, but we'll be interested in how the maximum likelihood decoder behaves, okay? And so for the maximum likelihood decoder, what we said is and bound is to look at where this integral here is equal to the rate of the code, right? So this gives, will give us the best bound. And if we do this for this particular example for the three six, we would see here that this map upper bound, right, that we get, the upper bound and the threshold is something like 0 0.48815. So it's a little bit better than our initial estimate uh, and still, of course, bounded away. And remember that the BP threshold, I mean, if we did thing, was 0 0.4329, okay? It was about 0 0.4, I guess it was 0 0.43 or something, okay? Good, so now, uh, fine, so we get, we get a better upper bound. But, um, you know, this was not the whole point. The whole point will turn out that this bound actually will turn out to be correct, okay? So we'll, we'll turn out, and hopefully by the end of today, we'll see why that's true, is that that actually indeed is the map threshold. And um, we'll see how this is connected to the spatially coupled. And you know, right now we're just talking about the uncoupled code. There's no coupling in there in principle. Okay, so the key, um, trying to understand that, is to look again at an area. And so we're gonna do another calculation it will be even less motivated than last time when we did a calculation, and we'll have to see where this comes about. So what I want to do is the following. I want to do the following calculation. I want to look at the area that's enclosed by this funny shaped curve, okay? I want to look at the area that's inside this BP exit curve, right? Including the uh, unstable fixed point that I have here. Okay, so you can do calculation. And if we did the calculation for this particular example, what do you think we get? It's just a calculation, okay? We have, we have an explicit, I mean, this is explicit, this is explicit, okay? You can compute that. What do you think we get? So right now I'm interested, remember we had this original area calculation, okay, which was I take the exit, the actual exit curve, and then this must always, there's a code invariant in here. Right now I'm looking at an iterative decoder, okay, has nothing to do with map, and I'm looking at this curve which maybe on top is an upper bound to the actual curve, but then it has this funny other shape, okay. I'm computing the area that's contained in there. Any guess? It's a guess because how would we know? <laughs> I mean. It's exactly, this, it's exactly this thing here. It's the set of all the fixed points. So this set of fixed points gives me a smooth curve. That curve contains an area, right? I'm talking about this area here. You can compute it. Huh? So, so um, yes, so, so this is the same as this one, right? So, so that, you know, you have to, this thing here comes from the recursion. This is because we're computing the exit, the so-called exit value, the best estimate, okay? Okay, um, you know, surprise, it's again exactly this, okay? It's again the area of the code, or it's again the rate of the code. Okay, so now fine, it's again the rate of the code. Okay, so uh, perhaps at that point, um, I, you know, it, it's pure coincidence. So it will turn out that the fact that this is equal to the area of the code will be one of the key ingredients for, for proving what we'll, we'll try to prove in a second. 
Now, what I want to do is I want to show you, you know, we could do this by calculus, right, because we have just an explicit formula here. Um, but I want to do it in an entirely different way because the proof I'll give you then will show that this is true irrespective if you do, if you do this with respect to uh, the BEC, which we always do, or if you do this with respect to a general channel, could be the Gaussian channel or whatever. And so this proof will be more conceptual. And so it will prove that this is true irrespective what the channel is and, and what exactly um, you're doing. This one, this thing here, yeah. You're saying where, where this hits here? Where here? Where this here? So, okay, so what happens always is that you're starting somewhere and you go down, okay? Now, what we're saying is that this has to go to a fixed point, this recursion, okay? And so the only fixed points of this recursion are either zero, okay, if you look at plug in zero, or exactly this, or these fixed points that here. These are all the fixed points of the equation, right? I mean, we're we seeing here, we, ha we haven't done any manipulations to it. Yeah, if you plug in zero, this, this will also give you back zero, okay? Okay, I should have mentioned this. So, so if there's no fixed point, non-trivial fixed point here, then it has to go to zero. Make sense? Good, so our aim now will be to show that this area is indeed equal to the rate of the code. And so rather than doing the computation, uh, let's, we'll relate it now to this other area here. So let's try to, to do this. So I'll, I'll draw it again for the three six. So let me look again at, at the one neighborhood of a particular bit here. And so um, let me now just think of a code that's associated to it. So I use a code that has this description. What does it mean I'm looking at a code? It means, you know, this code has this variable node here. And how many of the variable nodes does it have on the bottom? Well, there are L children that we have here. And each of these guys has R minus one children going down. Right? So it means the total number of variable nodes that we have is 1 plus L times R minus 1. Right? Make sense? OK, so this is the number of variable nodes, right? Now, but these variable nodes are not all independent. We have some constraints, right? And the constraints we have are these constraints, right? So we have some XORs here. And it means that the sum of these bits has to be zero, the sum of these bits has to be zero, and the sum of these bits has to be zero, right? And these constraints are clearly linearly independent, right? Because they involve essentially independent, uh, you know, disjoint bits. And so how many constraints do we have? Right, we have extra L bits, right? So it means we have minus L, so this means, you know, we have another L constraints here, right? And so uh, this means I could also write here minus two. So the degrees of freedom of the code, or if I divided this by the length of the code, this would be the rate. That's the equivalent of the rate. That's this. Is this clear? All I did is how many variable nodes I have. Then I reduced the number of checks. And so that's the rate of the code, but I didn't normalize it by the length. Okay, it's just the degrees of freedom. Okay, so now remember what we had said. We had said the following, that if I take any binary uh, linear code, right, and so then uh, what we have is these exit curves, right, and we said that the average of the exit curves is equal to the rate of the code, right, normalized. Or in other ways, if I don't normalize, that the sum of the areas of the individual exit curves is equal to the dimension of the code, right? So it's exactly equal to this. Clear? So now this is true, not just, you know, we just looked for the BC, but this is true generically for any code and for any channel. And so, so what are now, so what I have to tell you is now, what are the channels that are experienced by this code? Right now it's only a code. Right? So the natural channel that I'll associate to here 
will be epsilon of x. Okay, so there will be a, a family of channels that I associate here, parameterized by epsilon, and you know, the x, as the x goes, the epsilon will change. Is that clear? And so what is the natural, so this will be a BSC with this parameter, and what is the natural parameter that I so, should associate to here? Well, this, all of these will experience a BC with parameter x. So let me just go over this. So I have one special node, this could be this one, that sees the BC with parameter epsilon of x. And all the other ones experience a BC with parameter x. And now x goes from 0 to 1. Does it make sense? Yes? OK, so, um, okay, so now why do I pick this particular one? Because if I put in here x, what will be the erasure probability that goes into here? So, you know, if this is x, and I'm going up here, and then I go around, and this is epsilon of x, what will be the erasure probability that comes down here? So let, let me maybe retract. So there's something I didn't say. So this is now a tree, right? This is a tree code. This is no longer a code that's, that has cycles. And in a tree code, this message passing, which I forgot to say, is exact. So if you do on a tree code, this message passing back and forth, then you get map performance, okay? As long as there are no cycles in the code, that's the optimum performance. So what would be my optimum? So if, let's assume I wanted to figure out the erasure probability for a particular x and for a particular epsilon here, okay? So I wanted to figure out what is the erasure probability of this bit here, right? The way I could do it is simply to do exactly this dense evolution that I did beforehand. I have to go up, go via this bit down, and then go via this bit and compute the message that goes down here. Okay, so that would be, that, is, is that clear? So I have a tree code, and I want to estimate what is the probability of erasure for this particular bit. Right? Now since there are no cycles in the code, I didn't do the formal proof of this, then this message passing, right, simply figuring out these combinations and, and passing the messages according to rules that we talked about is an optimum decoder, okay? It's like doing the optimum map decoding performance. And so, so, the, so the claim is that if I do this here, because I picked that to be exactly this fixed point pair here, x and epsilon of x, that this message here, the erasure probability of this is also again x, right? So this was judiciously chosen so that the probability going down here of that being erased is also x. And then, you know, if I want to figure out what this is, what would be the erasure probability for this bit just as an exercise? So each of them is x. This is also x, right? So this is the same as having just a bit, which is this bit here, and having still five other bits attached to it, all of them being erased with probability x. Right? So what would be my best estimate for that? What would be the erasure probability for this? Sorry? Just the only time this will not be erased, right, is if none of them is erased, right? So this will just be 1 minus 1 minus x to the r minus 1, right? Yes, it's to L minus 1, right? So this is just the fixed point. It's all chosen according to this. I think I've lost everyone now, okay? So how can we get restarted? Any questions? So what is the following with maybe I ask? Yes, you, you'll ask the questions. X comes down, so the message has passed up to the root, and then the root is passing X with the fixed point to the X that starts with the Yes. So, okay, so 
let, let's maybe start again. So I'm looking at this code, okay? So the fact is I've drawn this in a funny way, but I've could drawn it in a different way in which the variables are like this, and then my check notes are like this, and I have a certain number of connections that come in here, right? I've just not drawn it in this bipartite manner because it's easier to see that it is a tree this way, but I could have drawn it, of course, like something like this, right? So this is just a code. Let's forget completely where this code comes from, right? It's a code, and so what is its length? The length is, there's one node here, the L times R minus one nodes here, okay? And then I have L checks here, so in order to get the numbers of degrees of freedom, how many bits, independent you know, bits I can choose, that's, that's the degrees of freedom that I have in this code, right? And the length of this code, as we said, is, uh, uh, is one plus L times R minus one. So if you wanted to have the rate, you would simply divide the two, okay? So you have N plus L times R minus two over one plus L times R minus one. That's the rate of this code. Okay? Fine. Now, um, what I do is the following. I'm looking at how this code performs for a particular pair of channels. Yes, please. Right. Right. So, so let's maybe first do one step because I think I did too many steps in one, okay? So what I do is not a following. In general, if I had a code, I would have all the bits experience the same channel, right? You know, because all the bits would see some erasure channel or Gaussian channel or whatever, right? So if we did that, then, uh, so, so if we first looked at that, and let's assume all these bits would see an erasure channel of erasure probability epsilon, just to get started, right? Okay, so now there are two tasks. One is to do the decoding, right? And the other one is to, to look at the performance of how well this code does, right? So now the point is that if we did the decoding, I want to now look at the decoding if I decoded it in an optimum fashion, okay? Now it just turns out that because the code is a tree code, because it's tree, there are no cycles in here, you can do optimum decoding by just doing this message passing that we talked about, okay? So you, you can just do this in a simple way of, of doing messages. And so maybe let's do it in a specific case. So for example, if, uh, uh, if here, for example, we had a question mark and this would be 0, 0, 1, 0, these are the things that you have here, and you wanted to maybe know this bit up here, right? Then you would simply take these messages and you would send them up here, do the processing and look up what the message is here. So example, if you have question mark zero, zero, one, zero, then what would be the message that I should pass up there? Would be a question mark because one of them is a question mark, right? So what is if, for example, I have here zero, one, zero, 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 then what would be the message that I should pass up here? Would be a one, okay? And then, you know, let's assume, again, I have maybe two question marks here, would also be a question mark. And so now if I want to do the best estimate I can, I get a question mark here, I get a question mark, I get a one. And then here, I'm not allowed to look at it because I do the extrinsic estimate. So I would say that this bit is one and I can actually decode it, right? Now, how would I do if I wanted to decode with the same set of things this bit here, okay? Now it doesn't, so if I wanted to code this bit here, then I would have to take these messages, pass them up here, then come down. So I have here a question mark, here a question mark, and, and, but here I'm allowed to look, and let's assume here this is also erased, this is also a question mark. Then what would be the, mes what would be the message that I sent now down? I have a question mark up here, question mark up here, question mark here, what is the message that I should send down? Again, a question mark, right? And so because I have already a question mark here, it doesn't matter what these are, then this message would also be the question mark here, right? And since I'm not allowed to look at this bit itself, this bit, for example, in this configuration, I cannot decode, okay? So you just have to believe me or know that this is an optimum decoder. Now we know how to actually do the decoding. Now we want to know what the performance of this thing is, right? And so if I want to know what the performance of this thing is, then I need to do exactly what I did now, but now I don't do it with values, but with probabilities, right? So going up here, 
I'm saying that each of them is erased with probability epsilon. So what's the probability that this thing is erased, right? Rather than now doing the values, I'm just computing the probability. And I sent this up here, right? And we said it's whatever, one minus, one minus uh, x to the r minus one. That's the probability of erasure, right? And so now I can do this for each of them, can either figure out this or take these probabilities here, look what the probability down here is. And so now let's just check, right? What is this probability? This probability is one, one minus x to the r minus one. That's the same here. So this probability down, okay, is now what? Is epsilon of x times one minus one minus x to the r minus one to the l minus one. Right, this probability coming down. But by definition, this thing here is just f of epsilon and x, right? Which is by definition, since this was a fixed point, equal to x, right? So I just chose now, so, so again I jumped over something, okay? So right now, I don't, I no longer choose everything to be epsilon. I choose now for this, everything I said doesn't, you know, there's nothing special about having all these bits go through the same channel. Each of them could experience its own channel with its own parameter. I just choose that this first bit, this specific bit, sees a channel epsilon of x, and this bit sees a channel x. That's just my choice, and we'll see in a second why. But because of this choice, this probability is again x coming down, and so everything is here x, okay? Going up is x, everything is here x. Okay, so I choose it, of course, in, in, a set, in the sense that it's very simple. Now the question is, why do I choose it? Okay, why do I choose it? Okay, remember that if we're computing these exit curves, and we're computing the, the exit curve for each of these various bits, then let's look at that. All these bits, okay, so, so now I have I have one special bit, that's the root. It has the channel epsilon of x, and then gets from, gets some messages coming in here, right? It gets L messages coming in here. And then I have uh, L times R minus one leave nodes. And if each of those look as follows, that that if I'm looking locally at these, they all see the channel x, right? So these are the leaf nodes here. They see, they pass up them, they see the channel x, and then there's an extra one internally that comes, but it's also x. They're all x. Okay, so now, remember, if I'm integrating between a useful channel, a completely useful channel, perfect channel, to a useless channel, then the sum of all these exit curves, okay, the sum of all the areas is equal to the degrees of freedom. Okay, we didn't state it as degrees of freedom, we stated it in terms of the rate because we had normalized by the block length. Okay, but the sum of all these exit curves is equal to the degrees of freedom. So now what I see is I have only two different type of exit curves, let me this one, the one I'm actually gonna be interested in and these ones which come from the leaf node, okay? So let me call this one A, whatever the area is here, and let me call for one of them this area B. So this means this thing here must be equal to A, plus, and then I have B, and now how many of those have they have? I have L times R minus one of those. Okay, so now the, f the important thing is the following. This A, this area here, okay, is exactly what this area that we are seeing here, right? Why? Because there's exactly the, these are exactly the, this is exactly the exit function, which is exactly what this, what this node here sees, right? And it has exactly the right parameters. This is the epsilon of x, and then there are the internal messages that come in here, right? So this area here is exactly equal to this A that I have here. That's just because we set it up that way. So if by any chance, 
we can figure out what the B is, right? Then we can simply bring this on the other side and again and figure out what this area here is. Okay? So now we have one more step, so we just look at this thing. So here we are interested in what this exit curve is for this code. This is a single parity check code, right? This is exactly the code that we started out, remember? And so and all the, the, all the bits of the single parity check code see exactly the same exit curve, right? Because there's complete symmetry here. This has x, and all these things have x, right? So what did we get as a result? So now the r here corresponds to the block length that we have in the code. What did we get originally for the exit curve of one such thing? Right? So what we should get is r minus 1 over r. And why is this true? Well, they all must be the same. And the sum of them, of the areas, must be equal to the degrees of freedom. But how many degrees of freedom do we have? Well, we have r nodes. We have one check, so we have r minus 1 degrees of freedom. And there are such exit curves. They're all the same. So one of them must give me area equal to r minus 1 over r, just by symmetry. Okay, And so even though I wrote things down everywhere in terms of the BEC, if you think of the fixed point densities for general channels, everything I said is true in general. It has nothing to do with the BEC. Okay, so now what we have to do is we just have to bring this on the other side, cancel, etc. And so what we get when we do it, we get that this is equal to the rate of the code. Okay, so there were a few conceptual things. Um, what's maybe confusing is like this. This area has something to do with the area of an iterative code, right? In order to figure out this area, I'm making an artificial code. And now for this code, I'm using the standard area theorem as we had written it down, okay? But it's important to completely disassociate the two, okay? This this is the standard area theorem that we wrote down. We're just applying it and happen to get as an answer this for this particular curve here. Okay? But it's important that we don't confuse this, these two quantities. Okay. Um, any questions? Any questions for that? No? Okay, so now what we do is the following. Um, let's just, just say the following. I've done this now for a particular such iterative code, but what's important is that I, have, I could have done exactly the same kind of, yes, please. It's for any kind of code that, it, so any kind of code where you can do iterative analysis, so for example, for spatially coupled code, that's a point I want to make in a second, the same would be true. Yes, so this has nothing to do with, you know, because that these are fixed points. If I had written down these equations there, I could have done everything. The, the only important thing is that there's some decreasing, it goes to a fixed point, and there's a family of fixed points that smoothly connects perfect decoding from useless decoding. That's all I need. Make sense? Okay. Good. So now, um, maybe just two, two remarks. So what I started here is this family of fixed point, and it smoothly connects, OK? Now, let's assume I hadn't quite picked this, you know, I had applied here not exactly the epsilon of x and the x. But let's assume I had slightly perturbed this so that this wouldn't be exactly a fixed point, fixed points. Is that clear? So I have a whole family of fixed points right now that smoothly connects from perfect to useless. But let's assume instead of taking here the epsilon of x, I would have picked up an epsilon tilde of x. And the epsilon tilde of x is very close, uh, you know, it's within some delta of epsilon. And this delta can make arbitrarily small, some, something fixed. Uh, but over the whole path, it's close, but not exactly. Okay? Then it's not very hard to see from this computation that you can also get a bound on the area. So what, what you will get then is not exactly this area but it will be an area that is some function of this delta, how close it is. Make sense? 
So if I had gone along a different trajectory, which wasn't exactly the fixed point one, and, I wanted, and now I plot again the one from the root curve, I would get some curve that looks slightly different, but I can control the area by how close this is. Okay, so if I give you an approximate fixed point, I get an approximate area, and as long as I can make this control, this, this approximation arbitrarily closely, I can control this area arbitrarily closely. Okay? Now, second of all, um, as you ask, we did all this thing for regular and for the BC, but I could take an irregular LDBC code, the same thing would be true, or I can take any other kind of structure. So, for example, we'll in a second take spatially coupled codes, and again, I can run the iterative decoding algorithm, there again, fixed points for this code, and I could plug in the same thing, and again, I would get that the area is equal to the to the rate of the code. Okay, so it has a priori nothing to do with this particular code. That's a gene generic uh, phenomena. The proof would be slightly more complicated, but essentially the same. Okay, good. Okay, so what we will now, uh, okay, so now having this curve here, okay, so, so we have this curve here. Um, what it will turn out is that we want to prove now is that the following, is that if I now look at, so this curve a priori, we don't know how this relates to the, to the map maximum likelihood curve. We just know it's some upper bound here, but we don't know exactly. But we can, again, define a threshold. The threshold is, again, where this area is equal to the rate of the code. So we can define some, which is called the area threshold, which a priori, we don't know how it actually behaves. And this area threshold is simply where this curve here integrated is equal to the rate of the code. Okay, it turns also out that this is the same where this area and the area below, I mean my drawing this doesn't show, but this area that sticks, up, sticks out and this area are equal, okay? Um, and so what we will show now is that uh, the following, that both for the underlying code itself, that's the map threshold, and second, that for the spatially coupled, that's the threshold that the iterative decoder actually achieves, okay? And so um, the key of this will be exactly the area here. Okay, so um, So now let's look at, so far everything had, you know, nothing had to do with spatially coupled. Um, everything had to do with the codes itself. And so let's just quickly review, you know, how do we construct from a code a spatially coupled one? Well, the idea was that I first have a standard ensemble, like for example, something like the 3.6. And so rather than looking at one such thing, I'm looking at many such, okay? So I have now, like in a picket fence, I'm giving you now many such codes. And I go on here and I go on here, and I have maybe some of order L of such codes that I put next to each other. And now, in order to couple them, what I do is that I don't just take all the edges to be internal, but I somehow have to connect them, and there are many ways of doing it. The easiest way for proofs is to do things randomly. In practice, you would do this more structured, okay, and there are advantages of doing so. But for example, for you, you can just think of that, for example, you have here three, no, three edges that are going out here from every variable node, and you're having six edges that go out from every check node. So you could think of the following, that for example, for each of this edge, you randomly flip a coin, and if the coin, let's say the coin has, let's say, three sides, if the coin comes up left, then I'm taking this and connecting it to a random check node, one to the left, okay? If it comes up center, you connect it somewhere to randomly thing in here, and if it comes up right, you randomly connect it to a check somewhere over here. Is that clear? Okay, so more generically, what you do is you have some window and you have some distribution probability 
And so you can randomly, when you flip a coin, you choose from this window and it connect to your neighbors, right? Just like in a picket fence and you can have different connection probabilities towards your neighbors. And this will influence some second order things like the speed of the decoding, et cetera, all the things that we're not gonna talk about. Is that clear? So we have many, many connections. So now some of the connections are no longer local, but so, so some connections now go over here, some connections go over here, et cetera, okay? Now, since this is horrible to draw, okay, let me take a slightly different way of drawing it because this is way too complicated. Um, and so the way we'll draw it is that, you know, this is also sometimes called protograph view, is that I'm gonna only draw, let's say, uh, you know, one representative for, for each such node. So these are the positions. And I'm just gonna draw a position, like this position, just one node, but it stands for, let's say, m such nodes that I have, okay? So there are maybe m such nodes that I have, and there are maybe m over two nodes that I have here, but I'm just gonna draw one as a representative sample so that I don't have to draw as many. And so again, so here, right, so I have a certain window in which I connect, perhaps, right? So there's a window w, maybe from zero to w minus one, and so then each of these, I, I choose maybe randomly in one of these things in the window, right? That's just my connection. Is that clear? Maybe? So that's exactly the picture I had, you know, when, when I took this graph, I had many and then they connected and I had the circle and that's exactly what I have, okay? And also remember that what I have is that at the end, there are more check notes than variable nodes, so there are a few extra, depending on the window, there are W plus one extra check nodes that are hanging out, okay? So in my picture, I had drawn it more symmetric. You can take these, where these positions are, you can move this, so there could be half of this sticking out here, half of them sticking out here. It doesn't matter, that's just a, a way of how to draw them. Yes? No? Do you want me to show the picture again on the, on the screen? No? Yes, so there are m variable nodes. For every variable node, I'll, for each edge, I randomly decide where to map it to, in which position, and, but when I then connect things, I also make sure that the degree distribution doesn't change, okay? So it will still be true that for every node here, every node everywhere will have degree three, and every node here will have degree six. So, you know, what, what will happen is if everything is right now for the large limit, so where the proofs go, then the deviations from the degree distribution will be just a water square root, and small deviations don't play a role here, okay? I, I tried not to mention it, but now where you did, okay? So, uh, you're true that you have to play around a little bit to get that right, okay? But right now, assume that this is, that you simply get everywhere exactly degree six and everywhere exactly degree three. Okay, if there's some sublinear fraction that has slightly different degrees, this doesn't matter. Okay? So, now, what happens here is that now I have positions, okay? So, I have position, let's say, uh, maybe my positions go from, let's say, minus L to position plus L, and everything that's outside here, you can assume that that's basically perfect. So, assume you have now something going from minus L to plus L, I'm just drawing it symmetric, that's slightly nicer, and everything outside here is zero. And so let's assume again, I have a code, a picket code word, every bit here goes for an erasure channel with probably epsilon, and now I do the decoding, okay? So now we can analyze, this is again a locally tree-like, you know, sparse graph. We can again use dense evolution as exactly beforehand to do the analysis. It's just a little bit more complicated. Why is it more complicated? Because in principle, before and remember, what did we have? We had x0 was equal to epsilon, and then we had xl being f of epsilon and xl minus one, where for this case, this was uh, epsilon times one minus Right, this was the dense evolution equations that we had before. The only difference here is now that in general, it's not true that if I run, let's say, five iterations, 
It's not true that a node internally sees exactly the same statistics as a node outside, right? Why? A node outside, remember, there was this boundary, and that boundary behaves differently, okay? So if I'm looking, for example, at something here, there are some nodes at the boundary, at the check nodes, that will actually have, you know, there's smaller degrees than the ones internally, and so they will see a different statistics, and so the dense evolution equation won't be, uh, won't be homogeneous with respect to the axis itself, okay? So what we have now is that all of these things have now a position, okay? So the i is now goes from, let's say, minus l to l. They all have a position, but now, unfortunately, if I'm looking at the i thing here, so this will be now a function of still the epsilon, but it will be now a function of the various positions that are within the reach, the coupling width. Yes? Uh, yeah, sorry. Okay, we use T. Okay, we use T. And then maybe we should use also here T. Okay, so this now no longer depends just on those, but this depends on, let's say, X of i uh, at t minus 1 and up to x of i plus w minus 1 up t minus 1. Okay, so the point is that if I'm, if I'm looking somewhere here and I'm looking what is the erasure probability that I, that's going out in the tth iteration, x of i at t, this now depends on where this position is. This depends on the i value itself, right? And it depends on the i value because if, you, if you're chasing down, um, so in this case I should have done it actually, this goes backwards, so in this case, I'm sorry, I should have done minus the way I drew it. So if you chase it back, you can see that, you know, the, since the way I drew it, it goes forward, that this could come from here or it could come from something, uh, let's say it could come from here or here, so there's a certain window from which things come. Actually, I think this depends actually on both of them. Let me just see. Um, just to make sure I write it down correctly. Yeah, it actually depends on all of them, okay? So it depends on x t minus one, also of the i um, plus one up to x t minus one of i plus w minus one. Okay, so, so if you look at where this, you, you have to do the same thing that you did before, and you have to unravel the computation graph. And so the question is, where do these messages come from, right? And so generically, this now depends on the whole neighborhood, but at, as a time, at time t, these things are not identical, right? They are, they have, you have seen initially when I drew you these, these x's are exactly in the graphic when I, when I gave you this evolution of the, of the degree distribution, remember? Uh, sorry, the evolution of the decoding process. And so these are, in general, depend on time, but they also depend on space, right? So you can write down again the dense evolution in the same way as I wrote it before, and, but unfortunately now, there's an extra spatial dimension in here, and so the analysis is no longer one-dimensional, but it's unfortunately L or whatever, 2L minus one-dimensional, right? Okay. Okay, so um, now let me just, before we break, let me just tell you now what the idea will be. So um, maybe I'll show you then again the picture so that we can connect it to the actual picture, okay? And so now when we analyze this, the analysis will be, the idea will be exactly the same. So you start this process, again, all these x's you can easily show are monotone, so they will again go down, okay? Again, they are non-negative, and so they will converge to a fixed point except that now the fixed points are no longer one-dimensional, but are, you know, 2L minus one-dimensional, right? It's according to the whole structure. And so we'll have exactly the same thing. We have fixed points, we have a family of fixed points, and from there we'll see how to an uh, analyze it. Okay, so we'll take a break now. Maybe I'll try to recover by showing you some nice pictures, and then we'll hopefully can synchronize again. Yeah. Yeah. 
So you, you mean here? You, you're talking about here? Absolutely, absolutely. So we actually need that here. But I wanted to have the fixed points that we can reach when we do the actual decoding on the code where all the code bits see the same, um, same bit. If the, if the bits saw actually different channels, then you would get different fixed points, OK? You wouldn't get what I said. Yes, because I was, uh, I was interested in analysis of, of that case, OK? Good, OK, we'll take a break. <laughs>